Joining me is Patrick Schumacher of Zaha Hadid Architects, Marius Miking of Snohetta, Filippo Gildardo of MX3D, and Michael Sayum of Grower. We are going to have a panel discussion about how robotics, artificial intelligence, all this kind of technology, generative design, and um, additive manufacturing are really shaping the world that we're living in now and in the very near future. Okay, my name is Patrick Schumacher, principal of Zadi Architects. We're based in London, we're a global design firm operating on all scales. My talk was about, um, well, my title was um, adaptive, responsive, creative, and I believe in a built environment that becomes creative and spontaneous and interactive with respect to the social process it is ordering, uh, but at the same time shaping, and more and more actively shaping. For that, we, we start to research not only into new manufacturing uh, forms, but also into semiological systems of design, but also responsive environments which make it happen, in particular looking at work environments for now. But I think the similar events could also happen in, in, in retail and, and entertainment environments, and potentially in certain amount types of emerging types of residential environment as well, like co-living, uh, uh, connected up with co-working, etc. So very open textures. And um, so that was my talk, and um, I'm happy to be here and discuss these issues. Great, thank you, Patrick. My talk was about uh, how we at Snert uh, in uh, different disciplines try to or uh, work towards defining meaning um, and the tools that we use, ideally through uh, dialogue, through, uh, through collaboration, and utilizing technology and uh, the inherent knowledge that is in our team and our collaborators' team. I'm Filippo. I'm a R&D leader of um, MX3D. We are a startup 3D printing company currently focusing on uh, metal 3D printing of uh, large parts. Um, my presentation was about uh, our company, but that was just an excuse to talk, to talk about something bigger, which is what is the social environment that has led a company like ours to flourish in the past three years, and also to give an example through the Bridge Project of how 3D printing and the state of the art in many different techniques can help to uh, disrupt the, the world of design, engineering, and architecture. Hi. Michael Siem, I'm Vice President of Design for Grow, and my job is very simply to shape the future of water. I work with a tremendously talented team uh, to do that, and we've really demonstrated how we're going to do that with new additive manufacturing properties uh, through uh, manufacturing techniques uh, and what the future holds with additional manufacturing capabilities of 3D printing uh, that we're using and introducing here at the fair. You've created this bridge. This is something that's never been done before. Um, were people quick to trust it? Well, yeah, definitely. The, <laughs> the reason why we created the bridge is to make something that people could use. We didn't make a demonstrator for the engineering world or the architecture world. It's something for, for everybody, for, for the citizen of Amsterdam and the tourists to try out. And whether they're going to like it or not, that's still an open <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, what I can say is that I'm pretty confident in the, <laughs> in the structural integrity of, of the product. I mean, I mean, I don't think we need to answer necessarily whether people like it right away or whether they buy into an aesthetic. I think we need to be market leaders as well, so people should learn to love this bridge. We are creating environments here for human beings, but these environments are often being created by robots, by algorithms, by artificial intelligence. I wondered if perhaps, Patrick, you could start us off, because you are often working at such a vast scale. How do you keep the human centered in your designs? Um, indeed, we try. And the question is really how one can have innovation and radical innovation, and yet have a sense of how this might be acceptable and viable and meaningful for audiences. And because if you go with a more traditional approach, you always have precedent and 
you know what you're getting and there isn't a big problem. So what I've just uh, shown here is on the level of complexity, we took a, a talk about large projects, large corporate campuses for Google or a big airport. The only way I've discovered we can actually credibly know what we're doing and have the user experience uh, at heart is through simulating the experience. So this would be visually through animations, through VR, but also the not only the individual experience, but the effects of a large agglomeration and interaction of people in spaces. That's where this simulation capacity I was talking about comes in and becomes important. Trying to simulate how people would move, gather, and interact. And of course, for that, we need to have experience, we need to tap into our own reflective knowledge about social spaces and interaction situations, and we need to know what the criteria of success would be. And that is something, a new research and development paradigm, a new sophisticated way of working with clients and with um, simula new simulation capacities which home in on social functionality and experience. We're just at the beginning of this. And that's, but it's important because of the complexity and dynamism of these spaces and of the novelty of situations we want to create. We want to radically innovate and we have that creative capacity to do so, um, but we want to know what we're doing. And of course there will be um, flops and there will be issues and problems when it comes to it, but to not make it a random search, we need to have that simulation capacity. That's what I believe in and that's what we are working on and it's something quite new. Uh, you can't just close your eyes and imagine what happens at that level of complexity. So this new form of crowd modeling and agent-based life process modeling is our way to make it human-centered. And you can, of course, from model generation to model generation, make that more tailored because these crowds aren't homogenous, they're differentiated with respect to client groups, status groups, various characters and social roles, and their cultural habits. You can encode in the agent, uh, and also from space to space, the scenario and situation expectations shift. You know, the different spaces between a public space, a private space, a semi-public space, a lecture hall, a library, they all come with their social codes and sets of expectations, and that makes it quite complex. It's not only evacuation and circulation, but it's uh, a whole field of potential experiences we want to have and move quickly in between. And that's a huge challenge, but the point is, yes, it's human-centered, but more than that, it is social process-oriented. It's life process and communication-oriented. We're coming to urban centers to be with each other, to co-locate, cooperate, to have a flourish of information uh, uh, as well as skill networks. That's why we're drawn into the big city to be close to many things and switch each day, each afternoon, we have maybe, I mean, I'm, my life is like, and most of my people's life are this, we have many different experiences. So that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. I think polarization in architecture and design is also a really good scenario, right? I think uh, we live in a society where you cannot please everyone, and I think we need to, to develop spaces that adapt uh, specific to the needs. I mean, we had some, some very, I mean, I'm in a very different situation. I'm not talking about large-scale residentials. I can prototype the objects that we're, we're talking about. I can test, I can see the consumer response. Yet, we can do that at a small scale, but the moment we reveal to the public, you get a lot of people trying to understand what's happening. And I think the role of design and architecture is to bring a level of newness into the discussion. We cannot rely on the past. We have to move forward. Uh, whether it's a large-scale residential might be uh, uh, something difficult to prototype, but that's where the role of simulation can come in. And we need to use technology to understand uh, behaviors. I think even the way water and large-scale infrastructure is still in a very traditional mindset. It's not, it's not following the user's patterns that might happen in a large-scale development. This might be an opportunity to add more intelligence. It's a, it's a learning curve. I mean, I mean, I have given up plastic bottles a while ago, but I'm on glass bottles, but what I'm learning here, you need to develop this revulsion against plastic bottles. And it becomes a kind of sensibility you acquire, um, and that then can kind of, consumers, I think, I trust, will learn this quickly. And if you can trust the product, 
and and that's the whole thing about about a critical um, investigative public with respect to your claims uh, then I think we uh, we a, a radical new product can fly through the market and that's the global market now. So that's why we have this fantastic opportunity where the great innovators, uh, when, if they make a move uh, that is picked up by millions and potentially billions, that's very empowering. And that's why this kind of startup culture is so, so fascinating uh, that we have living in that world of opportunity. Uh, and where many try to make this breakthrough and some of them will win and resources will flow back to do more. So it's a, it's a nice risk-taking atmosphere, and I like uh, what some of you guys are doing. So. No, 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 definitely. Because I know that you are looking at ways of making technology meaningful. I'm, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> debate Patrick on, uh, on social meeting places. Um, I think, um, I think the human-centered approach is very close for us. Um, and uh, and uh, recognizing that uh, change is fundamentally um, unpleasant for most people is, is something that um, we constantly have to, have to put into our mindset when we're doing new things. So if we can create meaning, if we know that we're doing things uh, due to a very certain reason or um, um, a story or something we want to take people with, um, I think that would help. And what about the environment itself? I mean, it's great to hear that you've given up plastic water bottles and that, Michael, that you, there's no plastic water bottles here tonight and you are developing a tap that could kind of replace that. But these new technologies, is, is there a cost or does that cost you because know, get overwritten by the benefit? Yeah, I, I think this is the role of design and architecture is to really address some of these large scale problems in society and embrace the technology to help solve this problem. And I think what's really impressive here is there's a lot of experimentation at very different levels. Uh, and this is, I think, going to happen. We may not all get them right, but I think you've got to be hands-on. You've got to approach it. And uh, I'm, I'm personally open to technology. I mean, we have an amazing R&D department that's constantly experimenting, constantly giving the right tools to look at water as a precious resource. And you know, we talk about it as, a, as an element that's transformative. It can really change your state of mind, but it also can cause disastrous uh, implications. I mean, these can be, so we need to take control of, of, of water, whether it's through single use or in large scale management of buildings with more intelligence. Great. Well, I think that is pretty much all we have time for tonight. Um, thank you so much, Patrick, Marius, Filippo, and Michael.